Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Friday, April 12th, 2024. The House passes a two-year reauthorization of Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA, one week before the authority expires. Before final passage, the House defeats an amendment that would have added a requirement of a warrant. Supporters were concerned that while non-U.S. citizens overseas are being surveilled, data from American citizens in contact with them was sometimes being collected. House Speaker Mike Johnson meets in Florida with former President Donald Trump, the Republican presidential likely nominee this year, talking about preventing non-U.S. citizens from voting. President Joe Biden speaks virtually to the National Action Network annual convention. Congressional Equality Caucus marks this Youth Day of Silence in support of LGBTQ plus students. This year, it's been renamed Day of No Silence. White House spokesperson John Kirby and President Biden talk about the U.S. keeping a close watch on what they call credible threats made by Iran about retaliating for Israel's strike that killed IRGC leaders in Syria earlier this month. Russia calls the United Nations Security Council meeting to protest the supply of weapons the U.S. and other Western countries are sending to Ukraine. And journalist Robert McNeil, one half of the long-running McNeil Air News Hour on PBS, has died at the age of 93. Story from ABC News, the House on Friday voted to reauthorize a key U.S. spy program considered crucial to national security. In a 273 to 147 vote, lawmakers renewed Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is set to expire on April 19th through 2026. It now heads to the Senate. Section 702 allows the U.S. government to collect electronic communications of non-Americans located outside the country without a warrant came under scrutiny among some lawmakers on both sides of the aisle and civil liberties groups because it sometimes results in the collection of data on Americans who are in contact with those surveilled individuals. An amendment was offered to add a warrant requirement to see data from Americans, but narrowly failed on a 212 to 212 vote. That was from ABC News. Here's some of the floor debate on that warrant amendment. Congressman Jim Jordan, Republican from Ohio, in favor. In 2021, 2022, the FBI did over 3 million U.S. person queries of this giant 702 database, of this giant haystack of information. 3 million queries of United States persons. And make no mistake, query is a fancy name for search. 3 million Americans' data was searched in this database of information. And guess what? The FBI wasn't even following their own rules when they conducted those searches. That's why we need a warrant. 278,000 times, not Jim Jordan talking about it, not Ranking Member Nadler talking about it. Washington Post reported last May that 278,000 times the FBI found, the Justice Department found, that they didn't even follow their own darn rules when they searched this giant haystack, this giant database of information on Americans. And so what we're saying is, let's do something that the Constitution has had in place for a couple hundred years that has served our nation well and protected American citizens' liberties. Let's make the executive branch go to a separate and equal branch of government, the judicial branch, and get a probable cause warrant to do the search. After all, it's done pretty well for this great country, greatest country ever for a long, long time. Why wouldn't we have that here? And oh, by the way, in a bipartisan fashion, coming about our, out of our committee, 35 to 2 vote, we said we will even put exceptions in there. If it's an emergency situation, the FBI doesn't have to get a warrant. They can do the search. If it's an if, if emergency situation, they can do it. We put exceptions in there. Here's the fundamental question. I raised this the other day. Here's the fundamental question. Of that over 3 million searches in a two-year time span, how many of those aren't covered by the exceptions we have in our warrant amendment. What's the number? And guess what? We can't get an answer. They won't tell us, which should be concern in and of itself. But if it's a big number, we should be particularly frightened. If they don't fall in the exceptions and they're searching Americans, searching your name, your phone number, your email address in this giant, this giant database, that should scare us. And if it's a small number, then what's the big deal? You don't need thousands. If it's a small number, but we can't get an answer to that question. So the underlying bill has got some, some changes in reforms that are positive, that are good. But short of having this warrant amendment added to the legislation, we shouldn't pass it. This amendment is critical. 
particularly when you think about the 278,000 times they abused the system, didn't follow their own rules. And now we say, oh, we got some new rules. I'll follow them now. No, no, no. The real check, the real check we have in our system is a separate and equal branch of government signing off on it. That's how we do things in America. Congressman Jim Jordan, Republican from Ohio, chair of the Judiciary Committee on the House floor. Supporters of this amendment came from both ends of the political spectrum. Congressman Jordan was the first ever chair of the House Freedom Caucus. And Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, Democrat from Washington State, the current chair of the Progressive Caucus, also spoke in favor. We have a critical opportunity today to stand up for the civil liberties that are enshrined in our Constitution while also safeguarding our national security. Every single day, the FBI conducts an average of 500 warrantless searches of Americans' private communications, resulting in over 278,000 searches in one year alone. The FBI has invaded the privacy of members of Congress, a state court judge who reported civil rights violations by a local police chief, Black Lives Matter protesters, and more. We cannot pass this bill without additional protections, like my amendment with Representative Biggs and Nadler and Jordan and Lofgren and Davidson to close the backdoor search loophole. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, Democrat from Washington State, on the House floor. Congressman Mike Turner, Republican from Ohio, chair of the Intelligence Committee, opposed the amendment. Everyone is in agreement that there have been unbelievable abuses by the FBI of access to foreign intelligence. The underlying bill, of which there's broad support, punishes the FBI. It criminalizes the FBI's abuses. It limits and restricts the FBI's access to foreign intelligence. And it further puts guardrails to punish the FBI. What's also in agreement here on this House floor is the protection of American civil liberties. You have to have a warrant, and and there is absolute constitutional protection of Americans' data. No one in this statute, there's no place in this statute where Americans' data becomes at risk. The debate today, though, is not about FISA. It's not about spying on our adversaries. The debate today is about a warrant requirement in an amendment that has been offered by Andy Biggs and uh, Jayapal. This amendment largely drafted by Senator Wyden and co-sponsored by Elizabeth Warren, would for the first time in history provide constitutional rights to our adversaries. It would provide constitutional rights to our enemies. No court, no law has ever, has ever come out of this body that would provide constitutional rights to our adversaries. We spy on Hezbollah, we spy on Hamas, we spy on the Ayatollah, we spy on uh, the Communist Party of China. This bill provides them constitutional protections to communicate with people in the United States to recruit them for the purposes of being terrorists, for being spies, and for doing espionage. The 9-11 perpetrators were in the United States and they were communicating with Al-Qaeda. At that time, we made a grave mistake in that we were not spying on Al-Qaeda and we didn't see who they were communicating with in the United States. We changed that and we began to spy on Al-Qaeda and we got to see the extent to which they were recruiting people in the United States to do us harm. If this amendment passes, Al-Qaeda will have full constitutional protections to recruit in the United States. The Communist Party will have full constitutional protection to recruit in the United States. And there will be no increased protection of constitutional protections for Americans and their data. The only data that would become protected is data that's located in Al-Qaeda's inbox and the communist Chinese inbox. Congressman Mike Turner, Republican from Ohio, the Intelligence Committee chair on the House floor. The House defeated this amendment to add the warrant requirement to FISA Section 702. The vote was 212 to 212. A tie, and ties fail in the House. The breakdown by party, voting yes, 128 Republicans and 84 Democrats, and voting no, 86 Republicans and 126 Democrats. Then the underlying bill reauthorizing FISA, Section 702, passed, and that vote was 273 to 147. One more note, the reauthorization is for two years. That is down from the original five years in an earlier version of the bill. The bill now heads to 
the Senate. Current Section 702 authority expires on April 19th. Former President Donald Trump, Republican presidential candidate this week, came out against reauthorizing Section 702, and today he was asked about the vote. Do you support the House's FISA bill that was passed this morning? Which one? The FISA bill, and did you talk to any Well, I'm not a big fan of FISA. I looked at it, and I studied it, and I know it probably better than anybody. You know, they spied on my campaign. You do know that, right? And they did lots of other bad things. I'm not a big fan of FISA, but I told everybody, I said, do what you want. They put a lot of checks and balances on, and I guess it's uh, down to two years now so that it would come due in the early part of my administration on the uh, on the basis that we live up to the polls, because all the polls, we just had another one come out. We're leading by a lot, but it comes out quickly. I said, you do what you want, but I'm not a big fan of FISA. I think it's terrible. Former President Donald Trump presidential candidate this year, speaking to reporters at his home and club, Mar-a-Lago, in Palm Beach, Florida. Standing beside him was the House Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican from Louisiana. The two had called this news conference originally to talk about what they called a major announcement on election integrity. The early reports saying that they would talk about legislation designed to prevent non-citizens from voting. And an NBC News article in a preview writes, that's already illegal and very rare, but Trump and many of his allies have falsely claimed that undocumented immigrants affected the 2020 election and warned they could do so this year. Here's part of Donald Trump's opening statement at the news conference. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to have you at Mar-a-Lago, my $18 million house on the ocean and the bay. And uh, it's one of the problems we have. We have a a court system that's very corrupt. We have a border that's open. We have a lot of problems in our country. And uh, we have an election problem, and that's really what we're here to talk about today. Speaker Johnson's going to be briefing you on what we discussed, what we agree on. But uh, I would like to demand that our border be closed because we have millions of people coming into our country. Millions and millions of people are pouring in at levels that Nobody's reporting, nobody's going to talk about, but I believe you could have 15 million already in. Some are terrorists. They come from uh, jails and prisons. They come from mental institutions and insane asylums. They come from all over the world, not just South America. They're coming from all over the world. Venezuela announced that their crime is down 67 percent because of the fact that they've taken the gang members, the leaders and the members, and they've deposited them very nicely into the United States of America. That's just Venezuela. Uh, It's happening with the Congo. It's happening with countries all over Africa, Asia, South America, all over the world it's happening. Our country is like a dumping ground, and we're going to have it stopped. And Biden should do it immediately. He should close the border immediately. He needs no legislation. He doesn't need this gentleman. He doesn't need anybody. He can do it. I did it without any legislation. I had the best border we've had in ever recorded history. He can close it immediately. If he would have left, we we had stay in Mexico, remain in Mexico. We had catch and release in Mexico, not here. We had everything. It was perfect. It was a great, a great situation we had. And now we have the worst ever. I don't believe in the history of the world there's been a border like this. Donald Trump, former president and Republican presidential candidate, opening up a news conference at his home and club, Mar-a-Lago in Florida, with the House Speaker, Mike Johnson, who talked about the legislation dealing with immigrants and voting. But among the problems that flows from this open border catastrophe is directly related to this threat to our election integrity. Why is that? You need to understand something really important about federal law. Since 1993, the the National Voter Registration Act, we call it the, the Motor Voter Law, allows people to sign up to vote when they get a driver's license. If an individual only asserts or simply states that they are a citizen, they don't have to prove it. They can register that person to vote in a federal election. And you see, states are currently prohibited. Believe it or not, the states are prohibited from asking someone to prove that they're a citizen. The the federal voter registration form just has a check a box. And if you do that, you're good. The states can't allow it. We think that's a serious problem. And so what we're going to do is the House Republicans are introducing a bill that will require proof of citizenship to vote. It it seems like common sense. I'm sure all of us would agree we only want U.S. citizens to vote in U.S. elections. But there are some Democrats who don't want to do that. 
Uh, we believe that one of their designs, one of the reasons for this open border, which everybody asks all around the country, why would they do this? Why would they allow all this chaos? Why the violence? Because they want to turn these people into voters. Right now, the administration is encouraging illegals to go to their local welfare office to sign up for benefits. Well, guess what? When you go to a, a welfare office, they also ask you if you would like to register to vote. And so many people, we think, are going to do that. And you know what? If the numbers are so high, there's so many millions of illegals in the country, that if only one out of 100 voted, they would cast potentially hundreds of thousands of votes in the election. That could turn an election. This, this could be a, a tight election in, in our congressional races around the country. It could, if there are enough votes, affect the presidential election. House Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican from Louisiana, at the news conference with Donald Trump in Florida. NBC News writes that Speaker Johnson made his pilgrimage to Trump's resort in Palm Beach as he faces an ongoing threat to his job from Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, the far-right Georgia firebrand and Trump loyalist who has ratcheted up attacks on him less than six months into the job. Asked whether he supports Greene's motion to depose Johnson, Trump, the presumptive 2024 Republican presidential nominee, offered kind words for both. He said, we're getting along very well with the speaker, and I get along very well with Marjorie. We have a speaker who was voted in, and it was a complicated process, and I think it's not an easy situation for any speaker. I think he's doing a very good job. He's doing about as good as you're going to do. That was from NBC News. You can find the full news conference with Donald Trump and Speaker Johnson at our website at cspan.org. From Associated Press, previewing what President Biden is doing today. President Biden expected to give a live virtual keynote address to the Reverend Al Sharpton's Racial Justice Conference in New York on Friday. Organizers said Biden, who is ramping up his Democratic reelection pitch to black voters ahead of a rematch with Republican Former President Donald Trump this fall will tout his accomplishments and highlight policies enacted to address entrenched racial inequity. When he addresses the annual National Action Network convention, the White House said Thursday, that from AP, previewing the speech today. And the president covered a number of topics. We face a moment of choosing at a time when our very democracy is at stake. And that's not an exaggeration. Our democracy is at stake. One vision is propelled by anger hate, revenge, and retribution. The other vision, our vision, your vision, of perseverance, progress, hope, and optimism, and everything the National Action Network stands for and embodies. Here's the future we can build together. I see in America, where we defend democracy, we don't diminish it. I see America where, with your help, I signed the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act in the law, where I signed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act in the law, where we make Roe v. Wade the law of the land again, and we can do that. I see a future where we give hate no safe harbor, call out the poison of white supremacy. I see an America where the economy grows from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down, and where the wealthy finally begin to pay their fair share of taxes where working people finally have a fair shot with child care, elder care, paid leave. We're one of the only nations in the world that doesn't have paid leave. I see a future where we save the planet from a climate crisis and our country from gun violence. You know, my administration just yesterday expanded back, two days ago, expanded background checks. But that's not enough. We'll ban assault weapons, high-capacity magazines, because we did it once, we got to do it again. We must get it done. And folks, I know we can do this. I've never been more optimistic about our future. You know, we just remember who we are. We're the United States of America. We've come out of every crisis stronger than we've gone into it. And there's nothing, nothing beyond our capacity. We act together. So let's keep acting together. I'm looking to you for help. I'm looking to you for leadership. And I hope you look to me for the same. God bless you all. And may God protect our troops. Thank you very much. President Joe Biden in the Eisenhower Executive Office Building giving a virtual speech to the National Action Network annual convention in New York City. Back to the Associated Press article, although President Biden historically enjoys high support and approval from black Democrats, 45 percent of black Americans said they disapprove of the way he is handling his job as president in March, according to polling 
by the Associated Press and ORC Center for Public Affairs Research. Just over half said they approve. Members of the Congressional Equality Caucus held a news conference today in support of the Rise Up for LGBTQ Plus Youth in Schools initiative. Today is the annual Day of Silence sponsored by the group GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. Congressman Mark Pocan, Democrat from Colorado, chair of the Equality Caucus, said that this year the day has a new name. We used to have a day of silence. In past years, students would go silent in the classroom for a full day in protest of the harassment, bullying, and discrimination that queer students faced. This year, though, is different. This year, we can't be silent. In 2024, anti-equality extremist Republicans have continued to unleash an avalanche of attacks against our community, including by introducing more than 475 anti-equality bills across state legislatures, and extremists in the House of Representatives have introduced more than 55 anti-equality bills this Congress. It's bad enough to have bullies in school, but there are adults bullying children right here in Congress. Politicians' obsessive attacks threaten the safety and well-being of members of our community across the United States and add fuel to an already dangerously hot fire of bullying and violence bullying and violence that disproportionately impacts transgender and non-binary people. That's why today isn't a day of silence anymore. It's a day for us to commit to rise up and take action to combat anti-equality extremism. Republicans have been spending their time this Congress trying to forcefully uh, out transgender students, ban LGBTQI plus books, and keep kids as young as kindergarten from playing on school sport teams with their friends. Democrats, meanwhile, are committed to defending equality and ensuring every student can attend school and live their lives free from harassment or discrimination. It's why we continue to call for robust enforcement of Title IX to ensure that all students can thrive in school regardless of their sexual orientation, gender identity, or sex characteristics. Congressman Mark Pocan, Democrat from Colorado, chair of the Congressional Equality Caucus, with other members of the caucus and advocates at a news conference on the grounds of the U.S. Capitol. And in the background, you heard a bit of the rain. CNN article on the origins of this day has this. In April 1996, Maria Polzetti held a silent protest for LGBTQ rights at the University of Virginia. She said she had no way of knowing her idea would ultimately grow to become a youth movement. Polzetti said she was inspired to start the demonstration while taking a class on the civil rights movement and wanted to use a nonviolent method to draw attention to voices that were not being heard in her college community. Students who participated remained silent the entire school day and gave out cards explaining that they were being silent to raise awareness of issues facing the LGBTQ community like homophobia and discrimination. That was from CNN. Story from Politico's Morning Money. A team of economic heavy hitters wants to shake up how Washington thinks about the budget just in time for next year's tax reform brawl. MM has a first look at what they're launching today. The new initiative, the Budget Lab at Yale, is an attempt to widen the aperture of how policymakers weigh proposals that could have a major impact on the government's finances. It aims to go beyond what existing go-to sources like the Congressional Budget Office and the Joint Committee on Taxation can offer. The Budget Lab's pitch is that it will look at issues not included in current budget policy assessment methods in an attempt to account for a broader scope of costs and returns. Priority issues include the child tax credit, tax cuts, paid family leave, deficit reduction, and universal pre-K. That's from Politico's Morning Money. Today's event was held at the National Press Club, and after the White House Budget Director Shalanda Young spoke about the President's budget plan, Danny Yagen, Budget Lab at Yale Chief Economist and UC Berkeley Economics Professor, talked about the initiative. What are we doing? What are we trying to do here? We are bringing an academic, nonpartisan uh, perspective to try to do two things to democratize and innovate on the budget scoring process, to try to quantify the trade-offs that Shalanda emphasized are there, they're real, and they're hard to understand. And so the more information, transparent, easy to use, easy to understand, uh, that policymakers, voters, the press have, hopefully the better outcomes that we get, uh, more in line with, with, with what voters want. 
Um, we are trying to do this in sort of two ways, and we chose our two policies here to showcase the democratization half and the innovation half. Let's start with the democratization. So what do we mean by that? All of us in this room have had some experience at some point where I wonder how much this tax proposal or spending proposal would cost or raise if we increased the phase-out range or made it less generous this way or um, applied to these taxpayers. Um, that's very hard to do. It's hard to do in a campaign context, hard to do in a policy staffer context and uh, without the long lag that is needed for the precise estimates from the Congressional Budget Office, the Joint Committee on Tax, um, uh, uh, or other squirt being entities. And so what we have created for the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is a do-it-yourself online portal where you can go right now and start turning the dials. And we have tried to put our best brains forward here to come up with the different interactions that we run in the background so that when you mix and match, you can get approximate scores and distributions that give you a sense of who's gonna win, who's gonna lose, what's the impact on the deficit, um, uh, both uh, in the current year um, and beyond. Danny Yagen, Budget Lab at Yale Chief Economist and also University of California Berkeley Economics Professor at the National Press Club today at the launch of this Budget Lab at Yale initiative. On Wall Street today, the Dow down 475, NASDAQ down 267, S&P down 75. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi there. I'm Jonathan from C-SPAN, along with my colleague, Ben. Since C-SPAN's founding 45 years ago, the media world has changed. Remember when there were just a few TV channels? Now we've got streaming, social media, apps, and more. Through all of this, C-SPAN has stayed true to its mission of giving you unfiltered access to government wherever you get your news. As we navigate this challenging media environment with fewer people subscribing to traditional cable packages, our funding has been impacted. That's why we're asking for your help to keep going strong for another 45 years. Please donate today at cspan.org slash donate. Your contribution, large or small, helps ensure at least another 45 years of witnessing democracy in action. Keep C-SPAN thriving in today's ever-changing media landscape. Visit cspan.org slash donate to make your gift today. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you find your podcasts. Story from UPI, the United States is restricting travel for government employees and their families in Israel as Iran threatens to retaliate for an April 1st airstrike on its embassy in Damascus. The U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem announced Thursday in a statement that government staff and their family members were restricted from personal travel outside greater Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and Beersheba until further notice. It said it was enforcing the restriction out of an abundance of caution. The White House National Security Communications Advisor, John Kirby, in an online audio news conference, answered reporters' questions about Iran's threat. First, on on Israel, um, I was wondering, is there, um, has the U.S. gleaned any information that would suggest that a threat and retaliatory attack uh, by Iran is imminent? And to that end, are there any plans for the uh, president um, to meet with uh, advisors today or in the coming days to talk about contingency plans? Hey, Amr, uh, I think you can understand. I, I'm not going to get uh, into any great detail on, uh, on intelligence. I would just point you back to what the president said Wednesday in the Rose Garden, that uh, uh, that we are certainly mindful of a, uh, a very public and what we consider to be a very credible threat made by Iran uh, in terms of uh, potential uh, attacks uh, on Israel, and that we are in constant communication with our Israeli counterparts uh, about making sure uh, that they can defend themselves against uh, those kinds of attacks. But I really don't want to get into uh, armchair quarterback in this thing uh, in a public way uh, in terms of uh, the conversations we're having or uh, the, what, what we're seeing in the intelligence picture, uh, we do believe that this still is a viable threat. Uh, and that, uh, and again, we're, we're doing everything we can to, uh, to make sure that Israel, 
uh, can defend itself. As you probably know, uh, General Carrillo, Central Command Commander, is is in Israel uh, again, having those conversations directly with the with his IDF counterparts. So we're watching this very, very, very closely. Um, and I, I don't I, I don't have anything for the on the president's plans to speak to, except to say that as he mentioned to you guys on Wednesday, uh, he has kept himself uh, completely informed. He is being briefed by the national security team uh, multiple times a day uh, in terms of what we're seeing. Uh, and again, he has made it clear to the entire national security team uh, that uh, th that we will take seriously our commitments to the defense, the self-defense of, of Israel. The White House National Security Communications Advisor John Kirby in a virtual audio-only news conference today. And later at the White House, President Biden, after he finished his prepared remarks to the National Action Network Convention in New York City, answered some reporters' questions in the room in the Eisenhower Executive Office building about Israel and Hamas. How imminent do you think an attack on Israel is from Iran, Mr. President? Yeah, expectations sooner than later. What's the message to Iran right now? Mr. President, what is your message to Iran in this moment? Don't. Are American personnel and assets at risk, Mr. President? Mr. President, are our American troops at risk as well? We are devoted to the defense of Israel. We will support Israel. We will defend, help defend Israel. And Iran will not succeed. Thank you very much. What would trigger a direct U.S. response, sir? President Biden answering some reporters' questions in the Eisenhower Executive Office building at the end of an unrelated event. Story from the Times of Israel, members of the U.N. Security Council failed to reach a consensus Thursday on a bid by Palestinians for full U.N. membership, meaning the long-shot effort is now likely headed for a more formal council vote. The Palestinians who had observed Observer status at the world body since 2012 have lobbied for years to gain full membership, which would amount to recognition of Palestinian statehood. In a request to become a U.N. member, state must first pass through the Security Council, where Israel's ally, the United States, wields a veto and must then be endorsed by the General Assembly. That was from the Times of Israel. The United Nations Security Council today held another meeting on the war in Ukraine, a meeting requested by Russia to discuss Western countries sending weapons to, to Ukraine. Bloomberg News writes that Western officials worry that Ukraine is nearing a breaking point after the latest Russian missile strikes knocked out the largest power plant in the Kyiv region. While the U.S. doesn't see signs of an imminent breakthrough by Vladimir Putin's forces, a dire and mounting shortage of ammunition and manpower along the 1,500-kilometer front and gaps in air defense have officials warning that Ukraine is at its most fragile in more than two years of war. The next few months will be Kiev's toughest test, particularly with $60 billion of aid still blocked in the U.S. Congress. That was from Bloomberg News. At today's U.N. Security Council meeting, here is the Russian ambassador to the U.N., Vasily Nebetsia. You're going to hear the interpreter. Even Western colleagues are using the uh, words uh, unprovoked increasingly rarely when it comes to our actions in light of what we learned and saw over the past two plus years about the role of the West in the Western tragedy. This kind of uh, allegations no longer withstand any criticism. Today, the collective West has other concerns. The main concern is to keep afloat the Zelensky posse, which has uh, is been losing power in the country at a quick pace and has clearly uh, facing a military defeat. And the Ukrainian marshal's weapons, uh, equipment, and munitions have long been squandered. And although uh, the uh, the, the, the Western sponsors are finding it increasingly difficult to turn a blind eye to what has, he has wrought. The influx and the deliveries of these weapons are going are ongoing. At the same time, it is increasingly difficult for Western elites to pass over in silence information about skyrocketing levels of corruption in Ukraine, the absence of oversight and accounting for the equipment and munitions that are being provided, and consequently, the grave risks of these weapons and munitions falling into the hands of terrorists. All of this unsavory truth is something which we are tr they are trying to drown out with the argument that allegedly weapons deliveries are helping Ukraine to uphold its independence in the face of Russian aggression. Through an interpreter, the Russian ambassador to the United Nations, Vasily Nebetsia, at today's UN Security Council meeting in New York City, the Ukrainian ambassador to the UN, Sergei Kalitsia, 
sat in on the meeting. Those who fail to distinguish between the defending side and the aggressor, while making out of context calls to stop all arms supplies to the conflict area, should realize the real implications of their starry eyed position. In the worst case scenario, it may mean millions of new refugees, hundreds of thousands repressed, and press ganged to the Russian army for new aggressive wars. In their run, in their turn, Putin's allies, such as Iran and DPRK, seem to pay no heed to the Council's meetings on weapons supply and related concerns. They continue to diligently supply the Russian army with missiles, drones, and munitions. Iranian drones and DPRK missiles continue to kill Ukrainian civilians. We can only guess at what Russia is offering in turn. The recent veto on the renewal of mandate of the 1718 Committee Panel of Experts has been just the tip of the iceberg and apparently not the most dangerous for global security. Therefore, I would like to use this platform, which is broadcast around the world, to reiterate the calls of my president and my minister. We need air defense systems and fighter aircraft to protect our cities from the Russian terror. Once again, we need air defense systems to protect our citizens. We all, we all know where they are. Few dozen air defense systems and a sufficient number of modern jets and there will be no problem of Russian jets and bombs. We need artillery to move the front line away and to restore normal life in the territories occupied by Russia. And we need accountability in order to prevent the Kremlin from restoring its military potential for new attacks in future. Ukrainian Ambassador to the United Nations, Sergei Kelitsya, at today's UN Security Council meeting in New York City. Story from Voice of America, a top Kremlin spokesperson said Friday a draft 2022 peace proposal could serve as a starting point for prospective talks between Russia and Ukraine to end their conflict now in its third year. During a telephone news briefing with journalists, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov referenced a peace proposal floated during talks brokered by Turkey in Istanbul in 2022. He said the peace talks are usually based on something and that plan could provide a starting point. The proposal reportedly included provisions calling for Ukraine to remain neutral and limit the size of its military. From Associated Press, the Biden administration on Friday reassured the Philippines anew that, that the U.S. commitment to the island's defense is steadfast amid increasing concerns about provocative Chinese actions in disputed areas in the South China Sea. A day after President Joe Biden convened a trilateral summit involving himself, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, and Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr., the U.S. and Filipino foreign and defense ministers and national security advisors met to discuss strategic and military issues. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan hosted their Philippine counterparts at the State Department, reporting from Associated Press. All of them made some statements. Here are Secretary Austin and the Philippine Secretary of National Defense, Gilberto Teodoro. This is a historic meeting. It's the first time that all six of us have gathered to discuss the diplomatic and defense priorities at the heart of our alliance. Under the leadership of President Biden and President Marcos, our alliance is stronger than ever. And today we'll discuss a whole of government vision for this alliance. We all know that our shared security relies on strong military bonds, shared economic opportunities, and robust people-to-people ties. And at the Department of Defense, we're working in lockstep with our colleagues at the Department of National Defense to strengthen interoperability between our forces, to expand our operational coordination, and to stand up to to coercion in the South China Sea. And our commitment, as the Secretary of State said just a couple of seconds ago, our commitment to our mutual defense treaty with the Philippines remains ironclad. And later today, I'll be hosting President Marcos at the Pentagon. 
and I'll share with you what I'm going to uh, sh tell him, and that is that the United States and the Philippines are more than allies, we're family. And thanks again, and I look forward to a great discussion. Thank you, uh, Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin, uh, our honorable counterparts and colleagues. Following off from what uh, Secretary Austin had already said, it's indeed an honor to represent the Department of National Defense of the Philippines in this historic uh, meeting today. And it will be an opportunity to have a fresh, open, and candid discussion of our department's objectives in line of the broader strategy of a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, because this is the area where our interests converge. And in doing so, we hope that the family becomes a stronger family with bonds of a shared vision, not only for today, but for the future generations. Thank you very much. The Philippine Secretary of National Defense, Gilberto Teodoro, and U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at the 3 plus 3 meeting at the State Department in Washington. The others were the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, and their counterparts from the Philippines. From CBS News, Robert McNeil, who created the even-handed, no-frills PBS newscast, the McNeil-era news hour in the 1970s, and co-anchored the show with his late partner, Jim Lehrer, for two decades, died on Friday. He was 93. McNeil died of natural causes at New York Presbyterian Hospital, according to his daughter, Allison McNeil. That was from CBS News. Robert McNeil spoke in 2020 at the memorial service for Jim Lehrer. This from C-SPAN's video library. After a long deliberation, I became a U.S. citizen, actually a dual citizen. Canadian Parliament years ago said, passed a law saying if a Canadian became an American citizen, he would still be a Canadian citizen. And I think in that long uh, consideration, it was the American values that Jim represented and, uh, and, and lived by that finally pushed me over the edge. Values that in the recent CNN interview, he deplored seeing so mocked, so flouted, and so hard for modern journalists to defend in the current climate of politics and journalism. And he sounded in that interview, which may have been the last public thing he did, angrier and more um, committed than I recall ever hearing him before. He was, he was furious at what is happening in the uh, public estate in this country. Back in the 1960s, I was seven years with NBC, and I reported often for the Huntley Brinkley Report, which was popular in the 60s. And it intrigued me that um, Chet and David, at the end of the program, said goodnight to each other, one in Washington, one in New York. Now, I don't recall ever actually raising this, but um, Jim and I sort of drifted into starting to do that. And at the end of the program, if he were um, doing that part that night, he would say, good night, Robin. And I would say, and now I say it for the last time, good night, Jim. From C-SPAN's video library, Robert McNeil in 2020 at the memorial service for Jim Lehrer, his partner for 20 years on the McNeil Lehrer News Hour on PBS. Robert McNeil has died at the age of 93. PBS NewsHour posting on X, a lifelong lover of language, literature, and the arts. McNeil's trade was using words combined with his reporter's knack for being where the action was. He harnessed that passion to cover some of the biggest stories of his time, while his refusal to sensationalize the news sprung from respect for viewers. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word, and get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night and weekend.